and welcome to this episode of Corner Gallery. I'm your host, Romero Sarks, and today I have with me professor and artist Grant Hargate. Grant, how are you? I'm doing fine, Romero. Thank you. Great. So first and foremost, I want to ask you what got you started as an artist? Uh, a pencil. <laughs> pencil and paper, of course. Mm -hmm. Just like our baby crayons. Uh, but it was encouragement from my, my parents, primarily my mother. Mm -hmm. Just kept putting the stuff in front of my you should gotcha. do this, you know, you got this thing. They were kind of pushing you along to do yeah, it. Yeah, they sometimes I felt like they were pushing a little too hard, <laughs> you know. Well, it paid off, clearly. It did, it worked out. Yeah. So, at what point did you know that besides just doing this at home, or something that your parents were kind of trying to get you into, at what point did you know that you really wanted to be serious about art? Uh, it, it happened uh, late my senior year in high school, mm -hmm. because my, uh, Let's say my GPA was less than extraordinary. Was, <laughs> I think it was 1.5. Oh, wow. And I remember graduation, they calling the counselor up, am I going to graduate? Mm -hmm. And he kept me on hold for like 20 minutes, I think, messing with me. Right. But I figured, man, I got to do something. Because mm -hmm. I don't like making these conversations anymore. Right. So it was uh, by fall I was enrolled in a community college studying art. Mm -hmm. And uh, I been full of self-doubt ever since, but I never looked back, you know. Yeah, sure. I mean, I really fought hand, I mean, tooth and nail not to be an artist. I really, the idea of being an artist was not. You're just fighting it off, huh? That was not what I had in mind for me, you know. So Grant now could never probably convince Grant then that this is what the end path would be. Yeah. Because those, young those... Grant was so adamant about this isn't what I'm doing. Oh, yeah, those fellows don't. <laughs> they barely know each other. <laughs> gotcha. They barely know each other. That, yeah, that's correct. Like I said, I wasn't a good student. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole idea of going to school again? Right. No, I mean, with the Vietnam War was just getting over, so we were off the hook. Didn't mm -hmm. have to do that. But we had to do something, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I pretty well sh shot craps as far as sh studying science. And, yeah, what else could I do? Law? You know, family full of lawyers, I thought maybe I could do that. I can argue. Right. That's probably my problem. I argued. <laughs> <laughs> so it, if art didn't work out, maybe a lawyer, you probably would have joined the family and tried to get into that then? Oh, uh, yeah. But the irony is I was a, my first job was a golfer. Mm -hmm. I mean, a caddy. I picked up golf balls for people. Mm -hmm. Then I started caddying. And then I went through the whole process. Working at a pro shop, working as an apprentice pro, things like developing my game. Okay, mm -hmm. but then things changed. Okay, mm -hmm. that was my first love, golf. Right. So when this is all over, and, but this is my love now, you know. So maybe one day we'll get to talk to Grant Hargate, the golfer. Golfer, yeah, <laughs> he, he's in there. He's in there. <laughs> so you mentioned, you know, you had to pick something. So mm -hmm. you kind of decided, okay, let's try this art thing, even though it's not really what I want to do. At what point did you decide? Not only am I going to do art, I'd like to teach it as well, because you're a professor. Yes. So what made you decide not only am I going to do this personally, but I want to help other people as they develop this talent as well? You know, I, uh, I can't name the professor, mm -hmm. but I remember thinking, I like what they do. Mm -hmm. I mean, and then within a short time, you know, I just kept asking. I keep telling my students the best way to learn something is to learn how to kiss butt, you know. <laughs> Even if somebody tells you something 12 times, mm -hmm. don't act like you've heard it all. Don't tell me that again, you know. Act like you heard it for the first time. And they keep feeding you information. And this is the game I played. Mm -hmm. He could tell me 12 times, but I'm thinking the whole time, I like this. I like his, I like what he's doing. Right. It could have been a her, I don't recall. But I remember thinking, this is what I'm going to do. So they had an impact on you then? Yeah, the one or two professors. They were in love with what they did. Mm -hmm. And the subject matter was why I had come to see them anyway. Right. But the idea, <laughs> the idea of me being a teacher, it was like, you t I mean, if you could find one of my prof uh, great high school teachers mm -hmm. and you tell them that I'm a, a professor. They say, Grant, no way. No way, he's in jail. <laughs> <laughs> If he's still alive, he's in jail. Right. And uh, now they had a huge impact on me, you know. 
Wow. There's no, there's no substitute for a professor, a teacher, mm -hmm. a mentor, loving what they do mm -hmm. and getting satisfaction, giving it to an eager, eager mind, I guess. You know. Interesting. How long have you been teaching then in general? I started teaching at uh, University of Cincinnati. I, uh, I went to grad school in 1980. And so uh, 1981, I taught intro to painting mm -hmm. there for a year. Then I came home for a, well, I came home to resume my life after grad school. And it was about one year I was working in galleries in town here. And then uh, a friend of mine turned, uh, we were talking about trying to get a job being a professor or being an ad adjunct instructor. Mm -hmm. And uh, Greg was uh, teaching at Fontbonne at the time. He was from Wash U. We, we became fast friends, but he talked, these people at Linwood called him and invited him to come out for an interview. He said he's already engaged to call this guy. Uh -huh. So they called me. And uh, it, was a, it was a funny situation because wise guy from St. Louis, I thought I knew all the schools in St. Louis. You know, mm -hmm. well, there's Wash U, there's community colleges, there's SIU where I went, uh, Missouri Baptist. I knew the schools, right? Right. And I, we drove, drove past St. Charles all the time to go to the river up north. Mm -hmm. And the, the guy calling me, Dean Eckert, he said, uh, there's a university out here. And he told me it was Lindenwood University, or college at the time. And I'm, uh, I'm uh, going out of my way to talk him out of the fact that there's a school out here. Right. I mean, who are you talking to, man? I'm, I grew up in this town. There's nothing out there. No way there's something out no, here. There's no college out here. Uh -huh. And he said, no, sir, there truly is. You know, and they told me the 1827 and all this good stuff. And, and those, two, uh, those two gentlemen, they convinced me to come out here. Huh. That was 1983. Wow. So you've been here at Lindenwood? I've only missed one semester. Since 1983, yeah. up until we are now in fall of 2018, yeah. you've been here at Lindenwood. Yeah. Like I said, I only missed one semester. That is that's amazing. When, that's when I decided that the money in the instruction was not going to make it. You know, I wanted to buy a home. I wanted to raise a family and all these good things. I just got married. And so I went into the construction trade. Mm -hmm. I went through the carpenter school and I became a journeyman carpenter, okay? Mm -hmm. So for many, not many, it was nine years, I worked six days a week. Mm -hmm. And I taught here on Saturdays and evenings. And then during the day, I'd be swinging a hammer. But uh, only one semester did I not work. Wow. <laughs> that's amazing. So in that time, and that's... That's 35 it feels like years. a billion years. Yeah. <laughs> 35. I mean, when you, I guess when you really think about how far the 80s were, it doesn't seem so long ago, but when you really add it up, you've been here quite some time. In that time, what type of courses have you been teaching? Because I, I saw you not too long ago, I believe. We uh -huh. were in the Makerspace, a new area on campus to sure. create sure. things, and you were doing pottery. Right. And I thought you were more of a paint guy, because in our previous experience, we did some painting together. Right. So how many different things do you teach, or have you taught over the course of these last few years? I came into c ceramics or pottery because of a, it was a minor mm -hmm. as an undergrad. My major was drawing. Mm -hmm. I have so many millions of hours in drawing credits. But I had to choose a minor, and I, and I took ceramics. I got seven classes. But I was done with that, and I went to grad school, and my MFA is in painting. Mm -hmm. So there's three different subjects, so to speak, you know. Right. I mean, drawing's the best bedfellow for any subject matter, any mm -hmm. subject matter, whether it be history or art. Uh, as far as what I've taught, I was still, I was hired to teach drawing, and I still do that today. I got okay. two classes, and that's kind of, that's kind of cool. But in the course of uh, becoming a full-time teacher, mm -hmm. I had to teach two-dimensional design, color theory, uh, printmaking, all sections of painting, all sections of drawing. I was part of, uh, we started new coursework, you know, like courses that had to fit into our degree. But the degree right. blew up. I mean, it blossomed. We had figure drawing, which they'd never had before. Mm -hmm. We, um, I was just my thick head in this that 
would not let the maintenance people in dear departed President Spellman right. shovel down the ceramics department. They came out there with a little, what do you call those little baby bulldozers? Bobcat? Right. And they were going to take gotcha. all the kills down in, in the kill yard, just shovel them away. And I said, oh, we can't do this. Yeah. Then, no, 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 we need this. And so I, I really got excited about ceramics for a long time, long time. And uh, we built the program, you know. It went from one class every two years mm -hmm. to three classes a semester now. Wow. Yeah, it, was, uh, it grew. I had a lot of good helpers, though. All right, I helped them, however you want to look at it. Right. We had support of some incredible deans in those 35 years. Incredible deans. You know, and the deans are the people that know, maybe they don't know exactly what you do, mm -hmm. but they want to make sure you can do it, you know. Gotcha. And, uh, and they're the ones that stand behind you, too. The deans are great people. Right. They've got your back. They always got your back. They've always had mine at times <laughs> when they shouldn't have. <laughs> gotcha. And so 35 years. Mm -hmm. In that time, as you've mentioned, you've seen the, the degree blow up and blossom. Mm -hmm. You've seen the class schedule pick up. Mm -hmm. What other changes have you seen through the art program here at Lindenwood? Because not so long ago, you guys were down the street and around the corner, it feels like, and now you've got a spot on campus. So just talk a little bit about how that's progressed. Well, my f first office was in the original art building. We called it FAB. Mm -hmm. Now it's called Harmon Hall. Okay, so my, those were my studios when I walked into Lindenwood. Mm -hmm. And then we didn't, man, we hardly had two students to rub together. There was 220, <laughs> I think 220 students on the whole campus. Oh, wow. And uh, we had 22. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I remember the graduation ceremony one year, just like one hour. And I'm still teaching the class, <laughs> the Saturday <laughs> class. But, uh, you know, it, it, we went through our, we got our scratches, we got our bumps. You know, we were, some of us felt put upon, me. Right. That, how, dare you, <laughs> how dare you take my art building away, you know, mm -hmm. give it to the business people. Mm -hmm. Well, the business is always going to be a strong program. Everybody wants a business degree, you know. So, if you want money to come in the university, you better keep yeah. those courses available, you know. So we went. It, we had to relocate. We, we did a lot of kicking around in the basement of Harmon Hall, combining studios. Mm -hmm. Then we finally started buying down the street, Studio East. Right. That was a great deal, and. We did everything over there, except ceramics. Then we moved ceramics over there. And then uh, we leased another building next to it. So we had two great buildings right alongside each other. And alternated years, this one's getting rehabbed. We have everything over here. So finally, we got a, a huge complex of art studios over there. A little community. Right. Students had a heck of a time finding it for a long time. Mm -hmm. And that walk was, you know, if you walk from Scheidegger Center down to the old studio east. You've got to walk up over that hill and then you're walking down and you've got every bit of 10 minutes yeah. on your hoofs by the yeah. time you get there. You it's really, a nice walk. <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to smoke it to get yeah. there. And then, uh, so now we came back on campus. We've got this nice space here. Mm -hmm. We're streamlining. Um, I think what we're doing now is, uh, I'm not saying what we weren't doing is quality because we definitely were t always uh, pursuing quality mm -hmm. and, and rigor in the coursework. But uh, I guess the demographics have changed, okay? Yeah. And uh, a lot of people want to be movie stars, right? A lot of people want to, a lot of students mainly, want to study the commercial arts. Mm -hmm. I call them commercial arts. They're called graphics. The, the, the things that uh, I was once attracted to, uh, but uh, what, do, what do you want to call it? Commercial art, graphic, graphic design, okay? More students are being, uh, I think it all depends on the economy. Art's mm. never going away. Right, We've but been the here. medium is kind of shifting, you'd say. The, uh, yeah, the message has changed a little, especially if you're coming into college. Your parents want their, they want their children to get some bang for the buck, mm -hmm. you know? They want guarantees, and there's no way you're gonna get a guarantee with any college degree except medicine or engineering. Mm 
Yeah. If you want a degree, if you want a guarantee, go to a trade school, okay? Because then you're going to learn. But you're not going to get an education. You'll just learn s some very basic tasks. Mm -hmm. And then you'll go into a nice spot. The parents want, and the children are, children, that's such a rough word, the students. Uh, they haven't changed. They're very intelligent. They're very intelligent. And their uh, ideas about what they will do for a living have greatly changed. Yeah. You know. Um, I don't think art, maybe the studio is as sexy as it used to be, you know. Heck, we're, we're, they make movies about us. Mm -hmm. You know. <laughs> yeah, now a lot of the things are computer or technology. The technology like is a sexy thing now, not the, the life. Digital things and the graphic design. And right. You've got Photoshop, you can do all these artistic things, so it's kind of changing a little bit from the traditional things. Yeah, you know? yeah. So with you being one of those traditional people, right. you mentioned drawing, painting, uh, ceramics, when did you first start putting out work and getting it to the point where you were featured places? Because right now you're in our Boyle Art Gallery. Yes, yes. And you'll be there for the next few days. Uh, right. You've been there for about the whole month. Mm -hmm. At what point did you start getting things featured? And oh. when did it kind of go off to you? Wow, I guess I, I am pretty good at this. People yeah, want well, my I'm stuff in galleries. Yeah, I, I got some wonderful breaks. Mm -hmm. Very early, extremely good breaks, you know. Um, I think it's 1978, 77. The graduate students at SIU started telling me, Woodman, you got to enter these competitions. I didn't know what a competition was. Mm -hmm. They said, this is how you do it. And they, the nice guys that they are, they showed me. Take a photograph, send it in the mail to this competition, wherever it is. Mm -hmm. And I went, boom, I'm getting in competitions out there, out of St. Louis, out of my school. Right. You know, I was getting in competitions in uh, New York, of all places, New York City. And I'm going like, but you know, like I said, I took it all with a grain of salt. You know, I said, big deal. I'm mm -hmm. thinking this is how it's supposed to happen. Ah. It's, maybe it's supposed to happen, but it doesn't happen. Right. If you ask around, it just doesn't happen. Yeah, it doesn't. <laughs> Something's over. Some hand's gotten. That's the ideal way for people, for most people. Yeah, happen, go to but New it's York not and the realistic way usually. Up there. Yeah. yeah. And then I got into some, uh, I entered some competitions after grad school that were just blew my mind that I was getting mm -hmm. into them. You know, international drawing biennales in France, you know. Oh, wow. Those are the big words to be using, international and biennale. Yeah. The same. And it was like, wow, how did that just happen? Uh -huh. It was just, so f sometimes it was just a fluke, you know. <laughs> And then we got another competition that it was just a, my buddy said, let's go, Woody, well, let's uh, enter this competition. Mm -hmm. And there was, there were five people in the, in the state of Missouri and they were picked as, as the, uh, the cream of the crop of painting in the state of Missouri. Now, that, that I don't know, Missouri, if you put it in the context of Missouri, it doesn't sound big. Right. But when you're thinking of Kansas City Art Institute, you're thinking Washington yeah. University, SLU, Mizzou, and all these colleges, you know, you're in some good company. Uh -huh. And these people are retired. You know, some people that have really been putting the chops in for 35 years. Right. And now all of a sudden these kids, 23, 25 years old, <coughs> are getting these spots, these sacred spots, sacred cows in these exhibitions. Mm -hmm. And so five of us, and three of us all worked in the same gallery. We uh, were chosen by a curator from the Whitney Museum in New York City. Okay. And he said, these five are your best you got to offer. So we toured. Our work toured museums. Wow. Yeah, it was cool. My friend said, man, you know, I'll, you can't take that away from me. I walked into a museum and I saw you work on the wall. Yeah. And I thought, that's cool. I wish, <laughs> wish I would have. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it just kept, yeah, I had to enter this stuff. And then after a while, I'd say it's, hmm, 35, 20 years into the process, I got real discouraged with it, you know, because mm -hmm. it was so much I thought. It was a little bit to do, but my business working at the galleries was schmoozing. I'm always schmoozing with people, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, got, I got 
but disoriented. Mm -hmm. And so I just walked away from it. And my students would say, why? Why did you go away from it? And I said, it's not what I want. Right. Right. So I had to leave it alone, man. I had to go. You need a break from that. I had to take away, go way away from it. The, not the producing. I always produce the art, okay? But right. the actual trying to uh, exhibit, publish things, whatever right. you want to call it. Publish them, get them featured, all that. Right. I had to take a break from that. Yeah, the scene. I had to take a break from the scene. Got you. You know, I was, it's not like they were throwing buckets full of money at me. Yeah. But I've the, had artists tell me that before, yeah. But the social thing, mm -hmm. I, was, uh, I wasn't equipped. Mentally and emotionally, I wasn't maturity. I wasn't equipped to deal with that thing. Mm -hmm. So as a matter of self-preservation, I just said, I, I've got Step away from it. You know, I've got, like I said, I got some nice breaks very yeah. young. And so I assumed if I'm walking away from this, they'll always be there. That's yeah. a bad decision. And that's <laughs> lousy reasoning. Uh-huh. You know, because once you, it's hard, it's hard getting back Yeah. to where people will even look at your work in the same town mm -hmm. that they always looked at your work in. It's a small class. I mean, it's a small group. St. Louis artists, a small very group. Very tight knit. Very, well, click. Very gotcha. clickish. Clickish, okay. Those groups, but, you know, when, you, when you're hanging out long enough, people start knowing you anyway, mm -hmm. in spite of your... In spite of yourself, people start knowing you anyway. Right. No, self sabotage that hardly works anymore. Mm -hmm. They'll think, wow, he's still alive. He's still working. And uh, when I came back, I just decided I'm going to come back with a vengeance. And uh, let's see what this hard thing really is. <laughs> okay. So the things you have now mm -hmm. in the art gallery. Yes. At what point? Did you develop some of those? I got a chance to look at them. You've got some really big ones in size, and you've got some really nice small ones. Yes. Uh, at what point did you start doing those type of paintings, and what, what's the inspiration behind them? Those have always been uh, a little talk I had with a student of mine, Jake Willie. He was in the um, uh, mid-90s. Mm -hmm. He and Stephen Cook and uh, uh, Jennifer Hill. There were three friends. And they were always, they always wanted to know everything about the art. They gave me the hardest time about walking away from this stuff. <laughs> Why'd you do that, you know? Mm -hmm. But uh, Steve, uh, Jake and I were having a discussion one day, and I told him, you can put light and shadow on anything. And it's going, whatever it is, you can invent it. If it's got light and shadow, it's going to be real. Because people mm -hmm. go, that's how we recognize it. That's what keeps us from walking into stuff, is light and shadow. Right. And so the, the, the idea was always... Well, since then, I've always carried it around. Uh, but I like the idea of just when I, whenever I'm stumped, you know, when the, the engine is not working, mm -hmm. I'll put objects out in front, in front of me and just start rendering them. You know. Those pieces were, the idea was been with me a long time mm -hmm. to get back to something I'd done in grad school. Uh, they were like the... Uh, there's three small pieces on the north wall of the gallery. And I can't remember their names. One's Southwest, and it's not important. But they were, they were the, visually the closest thing that I did. And I related it to work that I'd left alone in grad school in 80, right. 81. I just stopped. And the idea was always good. And I thought, man, the idea was good. Mm -hmm. So I finally got back to doing these things. They were like, I see them as these images that Da Vinci did. We did, we played them games. Like, there'd be a, a tent, mm -hmm. a painting of a tent with an X in front of it, you know, easy, X tent. Right. Rebus is uh, a term to explain them, uh, figured words, such. But it was always a very basic form of communication, you know, and it's, it's uh, kind of an ancient one. Like the first time we started making marks, we were trying to communicate through symbols somehow. Mm -hmm. Now those are not literally stories, mm -hmm. okay? They were first and foremost me learning how to do new things with a brush, me learning how to do different things with composition. 
thing about artists, you know, we learn very well, most of us, how to make uh, sound paintings and drawings. Right. And uh, in the 20th century, we were taught, oh, okay, that's good, but that's definitely not good enough. Because you have to do something beyond that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't believe it. I don't believe that. I, I just know that's how I work now. I, right. I still have to teach traditionally, so I still have to have those skills. But they were mainly, uh, all those pieces in that studio, I mean, in the gallery, were all done in a month's time. Really? Yeah, that's a lot of work in, for one month. Yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, well, for me, okay? Um, and they were all done, uh, there's seven smaller pieces, they're squares. Mm -hmm. And then there's three of the medium size, and then there's two of the large pieces, the codex. And, uh, and then there's 20 little pieces. The 20 little pieces were, if you consider this, that they're just pieces of the big pieces, okay? Because oh. I thought I can, I can invent these things forever. But I, I became painfully aware how limited my imagination is, uh. okay? And how susceptible I am to peripheral vision. Okay? Right. I was, thought I was doing something unique on one panel and immediately next to it I was drawing the same thing mm -hmm. with the intent not to do it. So right. I found out. Limitations. Well, I don't know if we all have them. I don't know if it's important that we have them. But that's how, that's how they came about. So just quickly here, in our last uh, <clears throat> couple of minutes or so. Sure. What would you like to say to aspiring artists or people that may have a knack for it but don't really want to pursue it? What would you say to them as far as maybe being open to thinking more about it? I'd say be open to it, you know, because mm -hmm. you're going to have to do something. And there have been many times where I thought, wow, why did I choose art? You know, I mean, I could have a ton of money by now and retired, you know. Right. But there would have been, I, I believe in the uh, expression, do what you want, do what you love, the money will follow. Absolutely. That's what, if you don't love what you're doing, you're going to hate a, a good portion of your life. You're going to not enjoy. Right. Because uh, most people with a little bit of passion, uh, you, are, I'm assured, uh, if you've got this passion, it's hard to turn it off, mm -hmm. okay? So you've got eight-hour days that you're supposed to be working. You know, most of the time we're up here 10 hours. But the, the soul, you can't turn that thing off, right? Right. So would you rather be talking self-talk about something you love doing or something you hate doing? Right. Either way, one of them's going to be a demon. That's going to be, well, they both are. <laughs> you're going to carry them around. Uh -huh. I'm not saying that's for everybody. That's just my obsessive nature. Gotcha. If I could turn it off, I'd, I'd turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go home, eat dinner, play with the cats or something, right? Take a walk. I got gotcha. you. Well, unfortunately, Grant, that's all the time well, we that's, have that's, today. That's, and I, uh, I appreciate you stopping by and talking to us. Okay. And I look forward to getting to catch up with you again sometime. I hope you got something you can use. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, that is all we have for today's episode of Corner Gallery. Again, I am your host, Romero Starks, and it was a great conversation with Grant Hargate. We appreciate you watching, and we look forward to seeing you next time.